Um, tonight's program is going to be a little different. Instead of having a single theme, as we usually do, we're going to have five different short presentations. Um, we're going to start with uh, John Prytow, and uh, he's going to talk about uh, the Canal Society archives online. And then uh, uh, Rich Rockwell from, from Bloomfield is going to talk about the restoration of the uh, 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 the Collins House, uh, which is related to the, uh, the canal, but he's going to explain that. And then I'm going to talk about uh, updates on the Greenway. Um, uh, quite a lot of stuff going on. And then uh, uh, Bob Goller is going to be producing a new book, and I'm going to be telling you about that. And then uh, we're going to close with Michael Bird talking about uh, a really interesting project of, 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 of a, yard, a large outside model of the, Morris, of the, uh, of the DNR Canal. So uh, it's going to be a really good and interesting evening. So uh, let's get started. Um, uh, Jackson, you want to uh, send the hosting over to John, and we'll let him get going? Will do. He is now host. <laughs> OK. I will share screen. Okay, can everyone see? Yes. Okay, very good. Good evening. Um, my presentation will be about um, an update on our um, archives online. So the big news is for everybody to hear, uh, for the first time we are proud to announce that our archives are now available online. Uh, as some of you know, some may not, we, uh, our archives hold a vast wealth of info on uh, New Jersey's two towpath canals, the DNR and the Morris. Um, included in the information are many items, historic objects, artifacts, uh, photographs, maps, documents, and many collections. So with our... Uh, use of the past perfect museum software, we have been able to accelerate the data entry of all our collectibles. So this was uh, became a critical step uh, that led us to uh, really channel our efforts toward sharing the archives uh, with the public. So this is how uh, you would get started. You'd go to the uh, Canal Society NJ.org website. With the activation of public access, our members and visitors can now go to the main page. And as you'll see by the finger click there, you would just go up to the top row of tabs. Uh, now they include a tab called archives. You click on that. Uh, when that happens, you wind up with uh, a submenu with two items, one with search, search archives, which we'll look at first and then uh, a contact feature. So the search archive, uh, once you hit the main page button, it leads you directly to the archive database. And this is what you would see. Uh, you could put in key, a keyword or keywords and then click search. Uh, the archives database uh, is searchable by those two things, keyword or, or several keywords. Um, if you see the tabs on in the middle of the screen there, uh, you've got other things that you could check out. Uh, random images, which the system will generate by itself. Um, objects and photos on MOS, if you like. Uh, when you pull up uh, searches, you will see such metadata as catalog number, date, uh, location, uh, and uh, what collection they're from. So if you pulled up uh, 
let's say you were trying to search uh, lock 18E in Newark, uh, this is what you would see. Um, it tells you that it's a, a photo of that, what the date was, it's from the Colada collection, it's got the catalog number, um, and it shows you the photo that we have, which you could click on to make it a little bit larger. At the same time, if you wanted to check out a contract that we have in the archive, here's a good example. Uh, a contract to enlarge the Mars Canal dated from 1845. Uh, this was from our uh, Mars Canal document collection. So if we went back to the row of tabs on the search, you could click home, which is the first one on the left, and it'll give you uh, some tips on how to search. So part two of the uh, original web page dropdown is the contact feature. Uh, that, if you click that, that links you directly to this page where you could put in your info and your email and you could uh, submit a question. And we would be checking that periodically to get back to you. Status. Uh, currently, there are images of over 1,500 objects and photographs now for both the Morris and the DNR canals, and more being added on a regular basis. So here are a couple of uh, cool snapshots that we have decided to put up. The Katie Kellogg boat, plane 9W in um, Stewartsville. Uh, heading into Lock 6 East in Dover, the last boat through there. A nice picture of Plane 7E in Boonton. And a nice white picture of uh, Plane 12E in Newark. So again, we have uh, in the system now photos, have an exhibit, documents, we also have other items. Um, based on our longtime partnership with the State Archives, we have such things as a large collection of uh, records on microfilm, over 100 rolls. And on there are thousands of pages of uh, Canal Company documents. These samples here show uh, board meeting minutes from 1833. There are other things on the microfilm, such as uh, cool power drawings, powerhouse drawings, elevation drawings. Um, here's one for a canal cradle boat, uh, boat cradle. And we are in the process of digitizing to try and get more stuff up on into the archives, uh, such as um, this project here where we got the large weir maps. Uh, we're trying to make it possible now for this information uh, in the archive available to more people. So uh, as we continue to grow and our collection grows and we continue to tell the story, uh, we can now also offer users the opportunity to, to view the great history of, of the two canals. Uh, so next steps would be uh, watch for an email announcing access to the archives. And uh, I encourage you to check the Facebook page for further news. And that is the end of the slide. I guess I will stop share. Okay. Uh, this is uh, Jeff here at host. Uh, I don't see any questions coming in on the chat, but I do have one myself. Are you looking for volunteers to help tag or otherwise uh, label the items in the collection? Uh, I guess, Jeff, at some point uh, we would uh, consider that. Yeah, right now we've been doing it piecemeal and a little bit uh, solely. Uh, but we are making plotting progress, but I guess at some point, yes, we could get into that. Uh, uh, 
question from R. Rice is, is there access to high res versions of the scans? Uh, the ones apparently are low resolution. Yeah, these, these are JPEGs. Uh, that was the point to put in there. Um, they were not designed to be the high res scans. So Joe, if, if you've got any other comments on that, um, down the road, I guess we could have a situation where people could uh, make an appointment to, to take a better look at them. But I have, I have a comment on that. And then a little yeah, bit. Yeah, please. Um, this, this is um, a, a work in progress. And so um, uh, we're just rolling it out. Uh, we're using uh, a very sophisticated and complicated tool, and uh, we're, we're gradually learning how to use all of its attributes. And so um, uh, it will get bigger and it will get better. Uh, one of, uh, just a bit of perspective uh, on, you know, uh, we've got thousands of items and thousands of records. And what uh, John is doing, he's, he's digitizing those records. He's re-accessioning uh, the records of all the items that we have into a database that's actually searchable. Previously, we have uh, paper records. Uh, Bill Moss uh, spent years monitoring and uh, updating our collection, did a wonderful job, but uh, that's one set of paper records. You folks are never going to see those records. Um, so, and then they're, they're, they're in the archives with everything else. And uh, Today, with the digital tools that we have, uh, what we can do uh, using the new software that's available is we can uh, uh, put those records, you know, one at a time uh, into uh, a database that is not only searchable, so you can actually find something. We've got so many items, you actually can't find things. There are so many, so many corners and so many places. Uh, thank goodness we have a very good handle on most of our major important stuff, but boy, we've got a lot of things and a long ways to go. So as things get added to this database, we can actually find it. We can call up an item, we can call the picture, we can call up a document. And then um, the next step is, as John has just explained to us, uh, we'll be gradually putting more and more information online for people, people to learn from. We're not necessarily aiming at putting publication quality images up there. If people want publication quality images. We will figure out ways that uh, will make that possible. But uh, for right now, uh, and a while into the future, we're going to be using the tools that we have. OK, well, that does answer one of the questions in the chat is, will prints be made available? <laughs> um, so you know, we will look at a method in the future. Uh, one other question was, if there are comments on identification of a photo, should uh, that commenter use the contact form or just email directly? Uh, they, they can use the, I would encourage them to use the contact. Uh, I will see it on an email. So they could Excellent. ask anything they would like. Uh, question is, will the PowerPoint for the meeting be shared? Uh, yes, this whole meeting will be recorded and put onto YouTube in the near future. Uh, so right. you can take a look at this stuff. Uh, let's see. Does the CSNJ have color weir maps of all counties? Warren County has theirs. That I do not know, Jeff. I don't know the extent of the weir map, so we're just getting into it now. Okay, so it's TBD, and then TBD. within any document, can you search for a name, or can you search for a name in a global search of the archives? Uh, not sure. If I, they mean I have, yeah, I well, uh, I think I may know what that is. You could search any which way, and it's been coming up uh, uh, pretty well, uh, pretty well searched. Uh, I've tried any different number of ways of putting in information by town. Uh, by city, by person, um, by facility, such as a lock or a plane, so far so good. Um, so I, I, I would go for it. Any which way so, you want to search, go right ahead. So there is global search, but it does depend on what happens to have been tagged. So you know, if you have peer store tagged on an image, you'll search for peer, you'll find it. But if you know we don't identify 
the people in that image you might not be uh, right. so lucky. Yeah, we, we try to get down to the finer points such as identifying who is in the picture. If we know, I try to put it in there in the description so uh, that info would, would show itself. Oh, there we go. That's the last of the questions. I think we can move on to our next uh, presenter. Who, who's next in the uh, hit parade here? Me, Rich Rockwell. Okay, so I'm going to spotlight you. Uh, are you able to share your screen? Uh, I'll try it now. If you need to. There we Thank go. You. Okay, that was easy. Um, okay, good evening, everybody. I'm going to give you an update on the Collins House in Bloomfield. So this is the Collins House. It was, oops, it was featured. Huh, sorry. We're going to have a hike. I don't know why I ended up on the bottom. Okay, so the Collins House was right next to Plain 11 East in Bloomfield. And it shows up in a lot of photographs of Plain 11 East. So you'll, uh, so this is it over here. Wait, sorry. Uh, um, a lot, a lot of the photograph, I mean, all the photographs we have of it are in the distance like this. We don't have any really good close up photographs because people were always photographing the plane instead of the house. So uh, another photograph, this is the Baldwin Street Bridge right at the base of uh, Plain 11 East. There's a Collins house over here. That at the time, this um, this wooden bridge was a farm bridge. Uh, Baldwin, it's now Baldwin Street. Was This was the McNair farm over here. And here we have the Collins house again. You see a smokestack back here. This was the diamond paper mill. Uh, the paper mill eventually bought the Collins house from the family and used it as the caretaker's house. And there's a rickety wooden bridge over here over what is Third River. So this is right. It's right between Third River and the inclined plane. Um, there were two generations of Collins men who were carpenters on the inclined plane or carpenters on the canal. John Collins and his father, Isaac Collins. Um, they built bridges and um, aqueducts and maintained all the bridges and the aqueducts and rebuilt them as, as needed over time. And this photo is from the top of Incline Plain 11 East looking down. And this is the Collins House here over on the right. You're looking at the back of it. And you can see that at this time there had been a couple additions built onto the back of it. Another photograph. And this one you can see there's a little... Uh, I guess they painted the stones here, so they'd have a little pathway, but there's a little pathway from the towpath up to the house and a little door, which I'm going to mention a little bit later. So this is what the house looked like in 2011. It had been abandoned for 10 or 15 years. It was owned, like I said, it was owned by the paper mill and the paper mill, the town ended up buying the paper mill property and the caretaker continued to live in the house until he got too old, he and his wife moved into uh, senior housing right next door. But uh, they lived there for a long time. When they moved out of the house, it was abandoned. And that's a, uh, that's a radiator you see in a bedroom up there. And you can also see um, how convenient. You can see the uh, construction techniques. This is rubble nogging in the walls. And there used to be a porch on the front, but it, uh, it collapsed in a storm. <clears throat> that's close up of the of the front with a gaping hole. Somebody tried to patch it up with some tarps at one point. Oops, sorry, I went the wrong direction. Another photo of the exterior. And this is what the interior looked like. It had been vandalized. The furniture, a lot of the furniture had just been left in there and it had been vandalized a number of times. Somebody actually tried to start a fire. Luckily, it didn't go very far. And the additions were the first things to go. The porch was the first thing to go. And then the additions that had been added later were, this is what one of the additions looked like. They, add, they added on kitchens and bathrooms and they were completely destroyed. And then this is, uh, there are two parts of the house, an older part that was built around 1790 and a newer part that was built around 1820. This is the oldest part of the house. And we had to do stabilization work before we could even put a roof on it. So that was all part of the process. We've been applying for grants for many years. Um, we got uh, the, the town has provided most of the funding for the work that's been done so far. 
but we just got a grant from New Jersey Trust to, uh, you know, the State uh, Historic Trust to work on the continuing work on the interior. We haven't done anything on the interior yet. So the Collins House is considered an East Jersey cottage style. This is not a photograph of the Collins House, but it's what it probably looked, the original house that was built in 1870 probably looked something like this. Uh, East Jersey cottage houses have three bays sort of equally spaced across the house and usually two windows and one door. They have a half story above with uh, a knee wall here in the front, um, no other windows. So this was a very typical, usually a sleeping loft in the second floor. And usually one room, it might be split up into a couple smaller pieces, but usually one, one room on the first floor. And this is what a restored East Jersey cottage house looks like. This is from a, an article by Janet Foster of, of a house near Basking Ridge that was, that was restored in East Jersey cottage. So this is the original part of the house, and this is what the exterior looks like now. We've completed the exterior. So we got a new roof, we've got the windows and all the siding and everything's painted. Uh, there used to be a door here. This part of the house was built by John Collins, not the carpenter, but he named his grandson was named John also. The John who was the carpenter was the grandson of John Collins who built the house in, uh, in 1790. And Isaac Collins, John's son and John's father, built this part of the house, which is newer, was built around 1820, much fancier, much more elaborate, larger, but, but built in exactly the same style. The interior had a lot of, um, a lot of more fancier finishes, woodwork and, and um, fireplaces, and the stairway was uh, much more, more of a federal style and, and more elaborate and fancier. This is the door that we were looking at before in, in one of the pictures. I think this might have been John Collins's office. Um, there's no reason that they would build a, an, an addition on the house with a door when they already had a front door and a back door. So it looks like they built something that they wanted to have an exterior door um, to use as, as an office or something like that. So we're hoping that we might be able to furnish it as an office. Uh, we rebuilt the additions and we're going to use those for modern purposes. The, Little section on the left is going to be public restrooms, and the addition on the right is going to be a conference room. So this, uh, with the all the interior is exposed now, all the plaster walls have been removed and everything's exposed inside. But there's some really fascinating timber framing techniques that that were used in the house that you can see inside. You can see these mortise and tenon joints with pegs, and uh, you know there's probably a lot of the, the building techniques that were used in bridges and, and the aqueducts that the Collins carpenters worked on that were the same techniques they used in the house. That's one of the stories we're going to want to tell when we interpret the house. This is the older part of the house where you typically see a ridge beam on the top of a inside of a roof. You just got hand carved joints with pegs. Uh, this is one of the walls that this was an exterior wall of the of the newer part of the house when they built the addition. They just put a wall on top of this. So when we tore the wall off, we have this what the original exterior wall looked like. And um, so you can see some of the timber framing up here and you can see the rubble nogging where there's um, rough stones in between the studs. We want to leave some of these things exposed. But um, the trust and the State Historic Preservation Office doesn't like that idea in general. If you're restoring a house, they want you to restore it as a house. And um, but since this was a, a, a modern addition, we're, we're we're making the argument that we should be able to expose the wall because uh, we want it to be part of the museum. So we still have to work out some of those details. Uh, we're going to be hiring a, an official preservation architect as part of um, Part of this next phase of doing the interior and we have some renderings of what some of the things that inside would look like this part will be a conference room um, the older section of the house will be a museum with museum space something like this uh, we'll have a caretaker's apartment upstairs and if we well, i would love to furnish as i mentioned this section of the house as an as if it were john collins's office 
that and hoping that it would look something like the photograph that you see. This is actually one of the incline plane powerhouses. Somebody probably knows what it is. I don't know which one it is, but these uh, uh, one of these is, these are actually the, the mechanisms for controlling the, the plane. And it was an office too. So there's a trundle bed back here in the corner and uh, we're, we're partnering, we're gonna partner with the Canal Society, hoping that they can help us provide some of the artifacts to furnish a room like this and possibly some of the funding. And we're also hoping that the house will be a um, visitor center on the Greenway. And as we, so this is all fenced in now, it's not open to the public and uh, it's gated and fenced in because it's, we don't want people in there now. Um, but currently, so it's right along where the edge of the inclined plane was. That's another thing that we'll have. We hope to have views looking out on where the inclined plane was with some interpretive signage and photographs. But now you can't really walk on the greenway in this section because it's JFK Drive and they don't, you, there's no pedestrian sidewalk or, or a walkway along that section of highway. So once we finish, after we finish the interior, then the next phase is gonna be doing landscaping outside. And when we do that, we hope to make the Greenway Trail go right through there, right where the, where the green line, approximately where the green line is, which would be, you know, it's close to where the towpath used to be pretty much. And we'll, you'll be able to have a continuous walk through on the, uh, on the Greenway. So we're going to do, we've been doing annual hikes twice a year. Ron Rice and I have been doing hikes twice a year. Uh, before the pandemic, we used, we took a five mile, there's a five mile section of canal in Bloomfield. And because 10 miles is too much for most people to walk, we took a bus for part of the trip. But because of COVID restrictions, we're just going to hold off on using a bus for, for now. Hope to have one in the, the full tour, five mile tour in the fall, but this one's just going to be a three mile hike on a section of the Greenway um, from Belleville Avenue to Wrights Field. And we're also probably going to be giving you a sneak peek at the soon to be Essex Hudson Greenway or whatever will, what will become the Essex, Essex Hudson Greenway. We're very excited about this in Ex Essex County, Bloomfield. Um, uh, you may have heard that there was an abandoned train line that goes from Montclair to Jersey City through Bloomfield and Newark and Glen Ridge and uh, Belleville. Uh, and uh, the state has agreed to purchase it from the railroad. And eventually it will be a rails to trails greenway. And it'll have a couple convenient connection points to the Morris Canal Greenway. So it's another one of these things where the, the greenway is connecting with other greenways and paths. So that's about all I had to say. If anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Yeah, we've got a few questions in the chat here. One was, please identify any structures that survive with the cursor. I think you did that pretty well with the uh, later illustrations and the mock-ups of the uh, building as it will exist. Uh, another question was, aside from proximity to the plane, what were the functions of the house related to the canal? Uh, we talked about the, the office functions there. Any other details? Well, the main, the main thing is that the Collins men who lived there, the two generations of Collins men were carpenters who worked on the canal, John Collins and Isaac Collins. The um, people think but a lot of people think the plane tender used to live here just because it was on the plane. But they actually, the canal company bought the property from the Collins family. They were living there before the canal was built. And the canal company bought the property from them to build the plane. Um, so they didn't kick them out when they created, created the plane. Um, the Collins family lived there until around 1900, which was when the paper mill sold it. So it's mostly the fact that you can, you're right on the canal, it's part of the Greenway, and that the Collins, two generations of Collins men were carpenters on the canal. And the office would have, you know, what you'd, what you'd, what would you expect to see in an engineer uh, who was, you know, building bridges, engineering drawings and um, information about 
various bridges on the on the canal and aqueducts and that kind of thing. Maps. Right. Um, one more question: What's the large building next to the house? So the large building next to the house, when um, <clears throat> it was originally a, a, a paper mill, and uh, the paper mill bought the Collins house, and the town, the uh, was a, it ended up, it had a lot of different owners. It was known for a long time as Diamond Paper Mill, but it was most recently Markel, and Markel decided to move out of Bloomfield, and they sold the property. The town bought the property, and someone luckily said hey, there's this old house and an old mill. You should have somebody look at this and see if these are historically significant. And Brian Morrell and his organization at the time, this was back in the 80s, did a uh, historic resource survey on the property. They determined the house was historically significant and should be preserved, but there was nothing left of the mill that was historically significant. So the town sold the mill property to a church organization that wanted to build senior housing, and it's a senior housing high rise now. And the town kept ownership of the Collins House and uh, didn't take care of it for a while, and now we're taking care of it. There we go. Much lamented Mark Al Paper of New Jersey. Oh, Mark, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I think in 2020, in the spring, when everyone was scrambling for, for paper goods, I think Mark Al was missed most of all. <laughs> yep. And as so many other people, they, you know, move to, they shift where they, where they move their mills to based on labor costs and distribution costs. And this area was too expensive for them and they moved to, I don't know where they moved to. They moved moved to one of their other facilities, but that's the story. Indeed. Um, so that is it for the questions we have. I okay. think we can move on to our okay, next presenter. Let's see. Remove the spotlight. Uh, who's up next, Joe? Be me. Okay, you are spotlighted. Okay, I should be able to share a screen now. Yes, sir. Okay. There should be a green. Yep, there we go. We're seeing it. Uh, this is a modified uh, presentation I did for the NJTPA a few months ago, but uh, it's brought up to date with what's going on right now. So I'm going to go through a whole a bunch of different uh, Greenway projects that are all making making progress. Uh, at our last meeting, we heard from Margaret Hickey all about uh, Lock 2 restoration in Wharton, and that's uh, still mo moving ahead, a little bit uh, slowed down because of the extremely cold weather. The uh, uh, carpenters and, and masons actually tried to work in the building over the uh, over the winter, but it was just too damn cold in there. So they've they've shifted and they've they've been building windows and uh, um, um, interior features and the uh, lock tenders shanty uh, at their facility in Trenton, and uh, they're gradually going to be moving back into the house and doing more work. So let's see. Um, uh, as we learned last time, the uh, the site, you know, this, this is a 15 year project, you know, starting with uh, um, a um, an empty field that uh, was was uh, excavated by uh, archaeologists and discovered that the lock was still there. And so um, the, the, the project uh, in stages has been moving forward uh, to actually recreate the uh, um, um, on the bottom, you see a historic picture of the way the lock precinct looked, and then in the upper right, my illustration of how it's going to look when it all comes back together. Um, during the, the process, um, long, long process of first um, 
excavating and restoring the lock. Uh, the lock was not uh, uh, destroyed, it was just buried. Uh, it was dewatered, it was cleared of, uh, of rubble. Um, all kinds of pieces of the working apparatus of the lock were, were saved and, and preserved. And uh, uh, um, the, the stone walls of the lock were, were reassembled and put back together again. And uh, at this point, uh, the, uh, the new lock gates are have been placed, you see down in the left-hand corner and the lock is uh, beginning to look like um, close to, to, to finish, close to being in operating condition. The, the next uh, phase happening this spring will be to re, uh, um, reconstruct the upper gates. And uh, at that point, um, uh, the lock will actually be operational. Interestingly enough, the, uh, uh, what's gonna slow down the process is that uh, the contractor really can't find anybody in this country who can make the parts. Seems that's quite ironic because 150 years ago, you could have just gone down the road to Dover and they could have made you anything uh, that you had in mind. But today you have to go and have this done in Poland. So a bit, a bit strange, you might think. Uh, here are some pictures of the lock uh, with the lower lock gates in place, you're looking down the canal and um, up the canal and up in the upper right hand corner, you can see that uh, we were on the front cover of uh, Skylands Magazine last summer. A lot of good press for the project. Um, so, hmm. Okay, I seem to be missing some slides here. All right, well, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go, go on. Uh, in Bootin, uh, we're still working with uh, the town to uh, create a, a path, pathway, a Mars Canal Greenway pathway through the town. Last uh, um, year, we donated the signage, this down in the lower uh, right-hand corner, uh, uh, dedicated by uh, Congressman and, and the mayor and, and uh, Elliot Ruga. And so uh, this year, we're going to be donating uh, more signage. Uh, we have the trail map that's uh, up in the upper right-hand corner available on our website for folks who want to go and visit and, and, and take a tour. Uh, uh, Bootin is a marvelous place. It has, it is, it has uh, a, a wonderful uh, history story to tell and also a lot of natural beauty that nobody really gets to see. And so uh, the picture of the Rockaway River Gorge in the lower uh, left-hand corner, uh, you might find yourself in a very rural part of the uh, uh, United States to find such a view, but that's that's Putin right here in Morris County, just, just up the road. Uh, and so eventually um, the town is funding a trails plan that will first uh, use our Greenway plan as its, its, back, as its backbone and eventually have other trails that lead to other parts of, uh, of, of the gorge to, to view the natural beauty. Uh, here are some of the uh, pictures. The railroad bridge that you see in the center will become a pedestrian bridge. Uh, the stone arch bridge in the lower left-hand corner, um, that will be uh, um, stabilized. I guess that's the word. It, 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 ha it has uh, some issues and to keep it uh, uh, sound for years into the future. Uh, it's going to be partially disassembled and, and rebuilt so that it is in you know, perfect condition. There's a water filled section of canal up in the upper right hand corner in Bootin that will be along uh, a part of the Greenway Trail. And in the lower right, um, the, the stone arches right next to the furnaces that uh, will now have signage that has say something about uh, what they might have been, but that's one of the great mysteries of, of this site. What were they all about? I've got some ideas share them when they're, they, 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 they get a little bit firmer. So uh, this year we're going to, the Canal Society is funding and had fabricated new signage that's going up that uh, is going to talk about the, uh, the ironworks uh, and the, uh, the blast furnaces and uh, uh, tell that part of the story along the route of the Morris Canal Greenway. Um, those signs are fabricated now and they're just waiting to be installed. They're in the DOT and uh, we're just waiting for some, uh, a little bit warmer weather and uh, they will be in place. 
uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the, the site of the ironworks, the two privately owned uh, lots uh, down in the, the, the uh, historic district uh, of Grace Lord Park, uh, were acquired by a developer, and he's been making a mess of them, but uh, there are still some historic elements left, and we have been bargaining with him to try to save possibly the Eston House, the, the former manager's house that you see in the center. Uh, there is the uh, blacksmith shop powerhouse that you see in the upper right, the stone uh, brick building that's up on top of the uh, uh, long, long retaining wall. And then across the bottom of the picture is uh, probably the largest historic structure on the site. That, that wall separated two segments of the water power system. The water uh, from the Morris Canal was passed down first to power the machinery at the blast furnaces and then collected in a pond that was uh, formed behind this wall and then passed down once again to power the machinery in the uh, rolling mills and puddling furnaces and then down another time to run the machinery in the uh, um, sawmill and uh, barrel making uh, part of the plant. So um, we're hoping that this wall will also be able to be saved and preserved. Um, we continue to work with uh, Lincoln Park. Uh, we have uh, three levels of, of, of signage that uh, we've provided for them. Most recently, uh, they've added a parking lot to the Incline Plain 10 uh, site and uh, we provided signage uh, for the parking lot. Uh, they now have, uh, they were awarded a uh, Morris County Trails planning grant this year. And so they're going to be uh, creating a loop trail at Plain 10 that will go, um, um, the trail now goes down one side of the, the canal and uh, the plan is to have a loop trail that goes uh, across the canal and back down the other side um, and makes a, a more interesting walk. So um, as soon as that project is finished, we'll probably be, you know, um, year and a half, two years by the time they work through planning and construction, we will be giving them the appropriate signage to bring uh, that part of the, the project to life. Okay. Okay. Okay, Mike. Mm. My computer stalled a little bit there. I'm trying to get back to, sorry folks. Mm. Getting there. Okay. Computers live to annoy us, don't they? Okay, ship and port. Oh, please. Mm. And it's going to give me dead maps. Today. It'll catch up. There we go. Uh, all right. Sorry about that. Okay, ship and port. This is plane one. And so uh, this is in Roxbury Township. And uh, um, the township has gotten uh, a planning grant from, uh, uh, from the county, County uh, Preservation Trust, to uh, preserve the site of, uh, of plane one. Uh, this, is, this is a marvelous site. Uh, it's, uh, several years ago, we worked with the County Open Space Trust to acquire an important piece of property that will be become part of the park here at uh, the Shipman Port Plain site. And now more property is going to be added and um, it's going to be quite exciting, but it's going to take a little while to, to grow. Now, all right, this is not behaving. All right, so you can see uh, a map across the bottom, bit mapping, I'm sorry, but uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, piece of property is, that is you know, yellow orange is being donated by the uh, uh, developer who's building condos up on the hill above this. And so uh, that's gonna be a, a main new section, but most of the incline plane is actually on that property and that's going to be donated to the township and there will be uh, parking and trail and actually uh, a connection between uh, the top of the inclined plane and the piece of property around the pond uh, that was purchased uh, several years ago with the help of the Canal Society. And then across the road, um, the site of the ship and port Bloomery Forge, uh, the, uh, the current owner is uh, and the township are negotiating to bring that into public uh, venue uh, as well. And so 
um, that will be the only um, um, the first uh, iron bloomery ford site in the county that is actually going to be interpreted and so uh, we're really really looking forward to that this is an interesting plane in that it not only provided uh, transportation assets for the canal company, but that the, they also sold the use of the water power from the site to run uh, first um, um, a sawmill, you know, here just below the, the, the first pond, and then the water was passed down into the forge pond and then used to power the, uh, the bloomery forge and then back into the canal uh, to be used further down. So. Um, again, this is in the works. This is another, you know, two years down the road before we get to um, uh, move in and help them um, uh, with signage and bring this to life. Planning stage first, construction phase second. So there's a um, picture of incline plane two, and this is also uh, uh, this. The, 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 this is actually in construction phase that uh, I'm afraid it's gonna be delayed. I just got a, a message just recently that um, this uh, site um, is a, a double plane, uh, planes two and three uh, almost join at their, at their bottoms and summits in, in, uh, in Canal Park and uh, um, at a, uh, with a uh, canal basin in between and that canal basin is uh, formed by a, a dam across a, a shallow valley and the, uh, excuse my language, the dam people uh, have been after the township to uh, revitalize that dam for years. So that, that's happening, you know, I think Monday it starts. So that's going to take uh, uh, two or three months to complete that work. And so when that's done, the uh, further restoration of the incline plain site will begin. Um, we have uh, a three-page walking tour guide that you see up in the upper right-hand corner for, for Ledgewood that uh, starts at uh, um, in the historic district along Old Main Street and talks about the, uh, the rig site across the road and uh, plane one and pl uh, plane two and plane three and gives a very thorough tour of that area. So if you folks haven't been there or want to go there again, please go to our website, download these walking tours and take advantage. Uh, the uh, uh, restoration of this site uh, started years ago, back in, in, in 2008, when the uh, Rotary, Turbine Chamber uh, and the Rotary Club and the uh, Township partnered together with the Canal Society to uh, keep the, uh, the Turbine Chamber from collapsing. Uh, on the, the stone arch that you see on the, on the right uh, was about to come apart and that whole uh, uh, wall was about to, to come down and, so, and needed lots of loving care. So uh, engineers and archeologists uh, came together, uh, contractors uh, fixed the arch, repointed all the stonework, uh, completely uh, uh, renovated the, 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 the structure, you know, brought it, um, um, previously, it had just been a hole in the ground. The the uh, the top, top of the of, of the uh, turbine chamber was just a pit in the weeds, was covered with some roll fencing. Uh, a disaster waiting to happen. And so this project uh, built the top of the chamber um, up above grade, um, lined the top with some bluestone, and actually constructed a, a, a shelter over the top to keep water from percolating down into the stonework again and causing the same kind of destructive process. So this part of the plane is, um, is already in excellent condition, but this site is probably one of the best inclined plane sites on the canal. It's one of the most complete and has been begging for additional restoration work. So that's going to start uh, this summer. As soon as the dam restoration people are done, um, they will start doing archeology span and then uh, uh, restoration of, uh, of, of, of stone features, and then a, a landscaping plan. Uh, people who have visited this site, you know that uh, it grows up to be a jungle. Um, it really, really needs a landscaping plan so that uh, it is uh, visible, understandable, presentable to, uh, to the general public. So that, that's gonna happen either this fall or, or next spring. Um, Construction projects are 
fraught with difficulties. They very, very seldom run on time and they're very complicated. Okay, moving along. View looking down the plane now, you can see there's lots of stonework that um, is fascinating, but needs some loving care. So that, that that's gonna happen in this, um, in this process. You can see some of the plans, <coughs> the work that's gonna be done up in the right hand corner the plans that have to be generated for a project less, like this are incredibly complicated. We've learned that going to construction meetings with the, uh, the, the Lock 2 project. Very, very complicated uh, doing this kind of work. There's the, the sleeper stones. Mm -hmm. I'll show sure that. Okay. So also uh, in Mount Olive, uh, plane number three, uh, plane number, um, I guess this is plane, yeah, this is plane threat. Okay. Um, uh, in the trade zone. It has been in limbo for years. Uh, we, we have had uh, relations with the trade zone owners for years and they've always promised, promised, promised they would donate the land, the property on which this, this plane sits and it, it's never happened. And so uh, finally, um, in partnership with the town, township, um, um, they're, this is actually uh, moving forward. The township has taken the lead here and they have um, gone through all of the steps uh, uh, to, to, to get the, the, the deed research, the, the, the uh, surveying, the uh, uh, environmental cleanup. There's a little bit of you know, environmental cleanup. That's, uh, that's, uh, some junk has been dumped on the property and that makes for, for uh, lots of problems. So um, that's about to be uh, completed. Uh, I think first, first they're going to assume ownership this this spring, and that then they will finish up the the, the environmental cleaning, and um, uh, and the site will become uh, public property. It is um, difficult to find, difficult to get to. Uh, the next step will be to organizing some some good practical public access to this site. First thing, get it into public venue, keep it from being destroyed. Uh, this is part of another series of maps that are on our website uh, for walks from uh, Stanhope and um, through, um, well, actually from Stanhope over to all the way over Waterloo. So more stuff for you to, to look at. Uh, this is one of the maps. Um, also, mm, the, the, the uh, work on plane four is also, well, supposed to be happening. This is uh, work that state parks uh, is in charge of it's on their property and um, unfortunately this is really lagging behind they've got a six hundred thousand dollar budget and it's not getting spent so there's not much i can say about what's going on uh, with this particular project uh, pictures of plane three uh, really neat snow scene lots of uh, sleeper stones and artifacts the uh, tail race tunnel still there a uh, marvelous site, lots and lots of stuff to see. Um, its preservation is probably due to its isolation. Uh, not a lot of people know how to find this. And so lots of details have, uh, have, uh, have survived. So this is now gonna be in public venue. So stay tuned, we'll get some public access in cooperation with the township. We'll get that arranged uh, in years to come. All this stuff takes lots and lots of time to, to make it happen. Some of these are just out of order here. So plane, plane four is in Waterloo and that's also going to get some help. Um, um, this is a transportation enhancement grant, $600,000 to do um, stone restoration and uh, to, to, to keep some of the, the aspects of the plane from, from crumbling. Uh, it's, it's got issues and it needs to be, uh, it needs some uh, practical access. It's completely isolated because the uh, uh, bridge. The, the bridge, the uh, the mule bridge, has uh, completely fallen down, and so there's really nowhere to get there except for quite a long walk around to the woods. And so, um, the the bridge never seems to get into the current plan. I've um, talked many times with uh, the NJTPA and that is supposedly going to be happening with the next phase here, but we need to first get through the phase of getting uh, light vehicle access to the plane, to, 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 to plane four on the Morris County side and um, get the restoration work completed. So 
I think I'm almost done. Okay, well, this is, uh, I guess this is the wrong version. This is why I'm having trouble. All right, uh, this is where Rich uh, pick up and this is where I leave. So uh, thank you for much for your attention. Uh, questions? So let's yep. see, in the chat, uh, let's see, there's a couple in here. One is, will the Wharton uh, Locks upper gate be a drop gate or a miter gate? The upper gate will be a drop gate. Uh, there you go. Historical have, accurate. Uh, is um, a bit of a mystery. Again, we have been you know, uh, attending the contractors meetings, which is a great education. And so, um, it's, it's quite ironic that, um, you know, um, 150 years ago, we could have hired ourselves a lock tender who would teach us how to do this. But now um, we have to learn how to work a, work a lock and how to make this, you know, rather simple machinery function. And uh, uh, the amount of water that we can get into the upper end of the lock is going to be limited. So exactly how the upper gate will function, uh, stay tuned. We're going to be able to operate the lower gates pretty much uh, as they should be. We'll be able to get our canal boat in and out of the, the lock and open and close the gates. Um, upper gates, drop gates, um, stay tuned. Lots and we, lots of uh, mystery. We will apply a sufficient amount of 21st sen century engineering to make 19th century engineering work. <laughs> okay, other, other questions? Uh, let's see. A uh, note of thanks for your graphic skills illustrating the historic artifacts and sites. I was welcome. And also congratulate for uh, congratulations from Ron Rice on 10 years as president. Oh. Mm. Apparently you are now tied with Clayton Smith. Oh, dear. I, I'm, I'm not tied with Bill Moss. <laughs> And, for, and I have no ambition to 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 out, out outdo Bill Moss. Um, uh, be, be, before I end, I think I've, I've got the wrong version of my presentation up here. I clicked on the wrong one, so I need to apologize for that. And there's a bunch of pictures of uh, what's going on at Lock Two that I meant to show you all. Um, we have um, been we were, we were there. Um, um, I think two weeks ago with the architects and the engineers and Pat Mueller and uh, deciding where the outlets were gonna go, see uh, planning how the interior, uh, uh, this is at Wharton, uh, uh, how the uh, lighting was going to be installed and uh, actually getting you know hands on uh, views and, and, and experience of, of the interior of the building. The building is now, both parts of the building are now complete. They're roofed in, and uh, I was there just three days ago, and the, the new permanent flooring is being installed in the main part of the house, you know, beautiful, thick uh, wooden planking. And so this is gonna be uh, um, an amazing project. We are uh, now negotiating with the, the borough of Wharton to uh, partner with them to do, to, to finish this job and to furnish the building and to do the same kind of programming that we do at, um, at, uh, Waterloo. Uh, at Waterloo, um, uh, at the lock site and on our canal boat uh, on the much longer stretch of Waterfield Canal. And so this is gonna be a great adventure. Uh, we're gonna be uh, reaching out to you folks because we're gonna need some more volunteers to, to make this work. Uh, it's gonna really be pretty exciting making, bringing a, a lock tender's house back to life. The same kinds of things that Rich talked about, uh, refurnishing his house and making uh, the, um, the, the that addition um, 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 into uh, an office uh, for for the carpenters. Where we, where we have a whole lock tender's house to bring back to life with with, with furnishings and displays. And so, um, stay tuned. Wharton DPW is very cooperative. Uh, Beers is reminding me that uh, the Wharton DPW is very helpful. And uh, when we bring our canal boat. To, to Wharton, they help to put it in and out of the water. And that's a really important thing. They so use a tractor. We are um, working to, to create a, a, a partnership with the borough and uh, uh, it's gonna be an exciting uh, year ahead uh, making all this happen. Okay. 
they have been fantastically supportive of us in the uh, Canal Day events. Yes. Okay. Any, if there's no other questions. There are none in the chat. Okay. Well, then I'm just going to do this very simply. Bob Goller um, is um, not with us. Um, he is uh, having uh, some health problems and um, he has declined to, to speak tonight. But so I'm here um, to tell you about Bob's new book. Um, this is going to be a great book. Um, he's been working on it for a long time and uh, it still isn't quite finished, but um, we've uh, seen and reviewed the manuscript and we're negotiating with a print and demand printer and we hope to have it published uh, this summer. This is really exciting. Um, it's a, a wonderful accomplishment. Um, I think we all know Bob uh, from his current work, uh, uh, his, his book, uh, uh, his uh, uh, book on the Morris Canal uh, across New, New Jersey. And uh, with every uh, uh, one of our uh, newsletters for the last many years, you have been reading his reflections on the Morris Canal. Uh, before that, <coughs> uh, Bob has been with the society since its, uh, its very beginning, and the, our archives that, that John told us about are filled with his work. Uh, Bob is probably the premier um, Morris Canal historian, and he's put all of his work and his heart into this new book about the abandonment of the Morris Canal, and it's going to be... Um, it's going to be more than 300 pages, hardcover with a dust jacket. It'll be a limited edition, and we're hoping to have it out this summer. It's going to be a partnership between the Canal Society of New Jersey and the Lake Apakong Museum. And so um, it's going to have uh, full text telling the, the complicated story of um, the, the twilight days of the canal and uh, uh, how it was abandoned. Lots and lots of uh, politics and engineering and uh, taking the canal that we uh, we all know and love and uh, um, putting, putting it to sleep, so to speak. Uh, many, many illustrations, many illustrations and photos that, that you've never seen before. And no matter how, how familiar you are with uh, Mars Canal pictures, Bob has got stuff in there that, that uh, you folks have not seen. It's a really marvelous and, and, uh, uh, collection. And maps and drawings, uh, all uh, drawings created by Bob, and lots of maps uh, to illustrate the story. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this is going to be a, a wonderful book, and I hope that it will well be well received. Uh, I don't have a, a, a price on it yet, but I think if you folks out there. Uh, are interested, think that you would like to own a copy of this book, we'd like to hear from you. We, uh, we're going to be um, uh, working with the, uh, um, the printer soon uh, to produce first a uh, 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 prototype and then we'll be going to press. And so um, if uh, you'd like to send an email to uh, our Canal Society uh, email address and reserve a copy, uh, we'd like to hear from you. So please uh, send us an email. Any questions about it, about Bob's book? You have any questions? Uh, can it be pre-ordered? Um, we're not going to take people's money just yet. Um, I would like to hear from you folks um, so we have some idea of how many to print. Uh, so let's let's go there. And uh, Bob is still finishing up some elements of, of the text, so making some changes, still working on the index. And so we hope that he will be completing that soon. But as I mentioned, he's had some health problems. Uh, he's feeling better now and he's back to work. So um, I don't want to uh, take money from people until we're ready for uh, to actually go to press. So uh, I just want a show of interest from folks who uh, would like to get on a list 
and uh, we'll make sure those folks get notified uh, as soon as we have uh, copies available. So we'll, we'll put out a notification, let people respond and, and join the list and Absolutely. then we can use that. Okay. Okay. Next presenter. Now you can stop sharing and I can pass, uh, who do we have next here? Michael Bird is next, Jeff. Okay, great. Uh, you, you are spotlighted, Michael, and uh, you should be able to, uh, Joe, if you stop sharing your screen, Michael should be able to. Okay. He stops. Still got a screen, I think. There we go. Okay. Let's see what I can do here. Uh, there we go. First of all, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, you are coming oh, through. Okay. Um, let's see if I can enlarge this a little bit, or maybe I can't, but uh, I should say that I'm joined on the virtual podium by Jim Lomax, um, who's been also a key contributor to the project. Um, so you actually have two Englishmen to tolerate um, with two, two British twangs. Both of us have been here for, oh gosh, 30 plus years at least. Both of us are very interested in canals. Um, you'll forgive Jim, he speaks with a Northern accent and I have this refined Southern English accent. Jim, can you, can you hear me? Are you participating? I, I, can, I can hear you, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh, okay. Um, can anybody see the screen? I don't know whether we can do better no. than that. Whether we, I can't see it. Uh, I am not seeing it either. Oh, okay. Um, see, we're seeing, seeing you quite well, but not. Oh, I should be sharing. Oh, that doesn't help, I guess. Let's try this. Is that there better? we go, yes. Oh, really? And I wonder whether I can make it a little larger than that, or maybe that's good enough. I think if you hit slideshow, that should You've full got screen. The slideshow at the bottom left. Yeah. Bottom left. The third button in that one. That one. Let's try. Yeah. Did, but maybe it will. Okay. Sometimes it gets out if you have multiple monitors. Okay. Well, is maybe is that. But we can see your your slide preview here. That's all right. So, well, and I can't actually uh, change my screen either, which is. Huh. I, I've got a copy here, Michael. If could you do that? Copy. Then that'd be great. Yeah. So I will get out of screen sharing then, if I can. Can people see my screen? Yeah, there we go. Great, thanks Jim for helping me out. Okay. So this will be old fashioned. You're gonna to have to say next slide as if I'm there um, with, with the with a lantern box, yeah. That right. sounds great, okay. Um, well, thank you everybody and thanks for, uh, uh, to allowing us to have a, a talk about this project. It's been about two years in the, in the making so far. Um, and I should also acknowledge Linda Bath and Canal Watch who took this on and put it under Canal Watch's umbrella um, and gave us a chance to develop this model canal and. The reason for this canal project was, as you know, the Delaware Raritan Canal runs along the Delaware River for a large part. Um, and there's towpaths in considerable use by people. And there are a lot of structures which exist along there for which people have no idea how they operate. Uh, the screen on the, uh, this is a lock in Lambertville, which uh, allowed the uh, canal boats to go from Delaware Canal over to uh, the DNR canal. 
very little of it, just the structure exists, but people wouldn't really have an idea of how it works. So the thought was to create a model uh, canal system which actually move boats, model boats, uh, to scale um, through a working lock. In fact, as you'll see here, uh, four or five uh, different locks and have it sufficiently so that uh, people could develop an understanding uh, of, uh, of how these boats work. So, and the other thing is to try and also, um, quite apart from the locks, to give people an idea of the boats being used and how they operated, and to make that as historically accurate as possible. Bear in mind, though, as you miniaturize uh, things, uh, materials uh, come into play there too. Next slide, please, Jim. If you could do that. Yep. So here's, on the left-hand side, is the uh, schematic of the Delaware and Raritan Canal. Uh, at the top left, you'll see it starts at Raven Rock, which actually is a way uh, connect with the Delaware River, and it's a water source. Then you have this feeder canal, which runs down to Trenton, uh, and then splits, so you go down to Bordentown, and the other is up uh, to uh, New Brunswick. So it's a Y, and the idea is for the model uh, to mimic this Y. Um, we have a museum, a farmstead museum in Lambertville, called the Halcombe Jimison Farmstead Museum. Um, thanks to Linda, again, making a contact with uh, uh, Tony Webb at the uh, museum. Uh, the museum board has agreed to allow us to uh, put this model on their property. Jim, do you want to say anything about this slide at all? Uh, yeah, so you can see at the bottom right, uh, there's a, uh, a plan of what we uh, plan to do. That it, there's a slope down from the buildings at the top of the uh, of the uh, the photo, and so we're having to uh, splay out the Y a lot to so that we go along the uh, the contours. And the idea is we have uh, originally there were seven locks up to Trenton, which is the joining point of the two arms. Uh, we're just going to put two on there and then two down uh, to New Brunswick. And there was just a single lock on the uh, on the feeder canal at Lambertville, which we will put in there. So we're going to have five locks. Uh, the, the, it will be to scale so that the, 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 the drop of each lock will be about seven feet, which is what it was at seven to eight feet, uh, so that when our scale, which is one to 24, comes to about uh, four, five uh, inches, six inches of drop. The access to the model is through the farmstead, but actual fact, you'll be able to see it from the Delaware and Raritan Canal towpath, and in fact, which actually borders uh, really the bottom of the screen. Uh, and on the other side of the Canal Toe Pass is the Delaware uh, River. So that's the location. Jim, can we have the next one? Next slide. And this is the incline that uh, Jim was talking about. This was, you can see these colored flags. We did a survey in 2021, marking out uh, what might be the location. It's hard to judge just from this picture exactly what it looks like. Uh, but this is the approximate location. I think the pink flags, Jim, represents one of the locks, right? I think that's yep. one of the locks. Yeah. Several of the locks, yeah. Yep. Cool. And uh, Jim, while we've got the picture, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the water supply and where the systems might be in the pound? Would that be a good place to, to, to mention that? Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, the idea is that the canal will be drainable, partly for winter, uh, so that it, it doesn't cause any problems with ice expanding. Uh, so the idea is that we dig quite deep holes at the, at the bottom of the two arms, uh, which are, is a reservoir for the excess for the water when it's allowed to drain out of the canal. And there will be pumps at the bottom of those uh, pits, which will pump water up 
continuously to the top uh, and then to keep the, the locks filled when they're in use. Um, there's lots of things that we uh, keep making decisions on and then we change our minds. So the latest idea is that the pumps will be 12 volts run on batteries so that we don't have to have a huge long extension cord going up to the museum's uh, workshop at the top of the hill there. Yep. Uh, but that might change. It's a lot easier to get hold of uh, 110 volt pumps than good 12 volt uh, submersible pumps. I should point out that I, I only know of one other model canal, uh, not even in the USA. Uh, so we're very much in a developmental, uh, let's see if we can make this work uh, stage. We really don't have uh, too much to go on. So it's, it's a little bit of trial and error. Um, the next oh, slide, I think, oh, sorry, yeah, go on. And, and I was going to say, we are trying to be authentic. And so our locks will have drop gates as the upper gate. And here you have it, right, Jim? Oh, right. Jim, yeah. Jim, yeah. Jim making right. that. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah. so we are going to cast our locks out of concrete. And you can see here, the left hand of the two lower photographs is the, the framing before it got concrete in. And then the second one, once we've filled it with concrete, took a lot more concrete than I thought it would. There's 10 bags of concrete in there. And so uh, it's not possible to lift it just by hand. My, my front loader on my tractor will lift it, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's fair old weight, which is good. Once it's in the ground, we don't want it moving around. So. Yeah, it won't be floating up. <laughs> yeah. So as Jim, as you say, you've got uh, uh, five locks uh, building, and then of course there's the actual canal itself to be built. So yes. So I... the, the idea of the canal is that we'll have a rubber liner, and the the original canal had what they called what was it, Michael Riffraff uh, stone That's on correct. the side. Stone liner. So, and so we're hoping to reproduce that with uh, mortar concrete with stones embedded in to, uh, to hide the rubber and to uh, make it look like the riffraff. And I understand it. One of the reasons for the riffraff on this canal is because of the power boots like this uh, steam tug here uh, causing wash, which would otherwise destroy the canal sides. And so that was uh, put on the Delaware and Raritan. Um, uh, I've learned an awful lot in doing this project. I really appreciate what Joe was talking about books, not only his publication, but also uh, books by Bill McKelvey and uh, uh, Linda Bath and so on. Um, a, the information there, and of course, the pictures. Um, the photo has been very useful. Uh, the tugboat shown here, the relief, um, uh, the, the tug started in around the 1840s. And so in building this, uh, took photographs, didn't really have any archival plans, but this is a scale model of uh, the tugboat relief. Um, it will be steam powered, it's steam engines under construction, but it also it does have in fact an electric uh, in it and it's currently radio controlled too, uh, so that we don't have to operate the steam power all the time. Um, the radio control, there'll be three or four of these uh, will be controlled by, uh, say, volunteers, um, and down the road possibly it would be done uh, by a, com a computer control system yet to be developed. Uh, Jim, next slide, I think. And here you actually have an archival picture of the, uh, of the boat, the relief. And archival pictures and also the archival information, John, you mentioned that earlier, have been extremely helpful as, as the Canal Society of New Jersey in supplying that. Um, also giving us uh, detailed diagrams and even some of the canal boats. Okay. Next one, Jim, I think is your hinge boat. Here's a hinge boat at Lambertville uh, being, I think, unloaded. And Jim, you're actually building a hinge boat, right? Do you want to talk about that? You've got a is picture, that, I think, uh, of the next slide. Yeah, so uh, I, 
went online and found that Lehigh University have got a lot of plans from the uh, Lehigh uh, Navigation Company of their boats. And they did actually, in, in uh, 1907, they did build some uh, steel boats, steel hinge boats. So uh, that was using thin sheet steel. Uh, I am recreating a hinge boat. It's, it's not exactly accurate because it's going to have a propeller at the back, which they didn't have, but uh, uh, mini miniaturizing uh, donkeys and mules is not easy, so uh, we can't easily get other horsepower. So uh, this, this will have a, a propeller and a rudder and be controlled by uh, a Raspberry Pi computer sitting in there. And you can see the size of it from the, the ruler there. So it's, uh, it's their, their boats were 10 foot something wide and each section uh, was at 20 odd feet. So it was, it's 50 feet in total and uh, sorry, 50 inches, 100 feet uh, and five inches equivalent to the 10 feet. So this isn't finished. It's got to have lots of more deck work and uh, then it will have, probably will get coal inside. And then the concept on the next one is to actually have at least three boats, the hinge boat that Jim's just mentioned, also a full length boat, such as the ones on the Morris Canal. Um, and then also a work boat, which I think we all saw in one of the earlier presentations as well. And that would be the, the starter. Um, so we've got uh, and, 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 and your tug, yeah, and the tug or two, you know, so yeah. uh, and different types of boats. Of course, what I really would like to do is to hijack one of the wonderful models you have in the uh, Canal Society Museum and uh, and base the full length boat on, on that. So uh, if you find it missing one day, you'll know where, <laughs> where it is. Um, so, Jim, we've got the next bit here. We've talked about the water pump operation. Um, we need to decide a little bit about the lining materials on the canal. Um, and then also testing of your lock gates, right, Jim, to, to make sure we don't have any seepage. And that's been difficult to do over the winter months, but I think you intend to do that fairly yeah. soon. Yeah, I think that the, the, the first of the, uh, of the concrete locks, I'll probably drop it into the ground here at home and uh, build a short length of canal on either end, test it out. Then we have to finalize the exact location of the canal, uh, these pounds at either end, the lockup uh, locations and so on. And also just make sure that the boats we have in mind will operate on this canal, that we don't make the bends in the canal too tight so we can't take up a, a four foot long model boat uh, around the bends on that score. Continue to gain information on the canal infrastructure and types of boats used in DNR Canal. We really do want to try and make sure visually, at least outwardly, uh, that the boats resemble uh, some of the archival footage that you've described. Um, and for that, we need help and advice. We've had a lot of help and advice from, I suspect, many of you actually on this uh, Zoom call today. Um, revision of archival drawings, photos, suggestions for use of materials and so on. Um, if anybody would like to build any of these boats and also we need an, an A bridge and so on, uh, that would be really useful. Um, Jim, next slide, I think. So once we have this kind of uh, in hand and you'll see our timeline, which will probably be next year, uh, the idea is to enclose the whole thing in a, in a fence uh, just to prevent people falling into it, although it's not a very deep structure. Um, we could also build other structures like the A-frame bridge and others. Um, and there's also, of course, the idea of developing educational materials uh, so that there's some explanation of what's going on. The canal model canal will probably be open to the public at a weekend or possibly also uh, one day during the week. Um, 
and you know somebody would obviously be uh, or one or two people be operate, operating it uh, while people are looking at this. Um, yeah, and of the, Jim? For, the, for the very distant future, we've had a, heard a lot tonight about the inclined planes on the Morris Canal, and we've got a nice hill that runs up from, from the DNR. I would love to put an inclined plane up there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As in the Morris Canal. But we've that's got... that's years and years away. <laughs> yes, we've got a few other distant projects as well. But the first thing to do is to um, essentially um, make sure that we can do. So the idea is in the next few months is to build a very short section of the canal actually at the farmstead and um, show it that one of the lots actually does work. So here's our timeline. Um, so late last year, you can see we cast a drop lock um, and, and started to do a water test. Um, we've started to construct a, a work boat and we actually have now a tug which can, is radio controlled and can, can maneuver. So the next stage is still to test out canal lining materials um, and then construct this se test section on the site and demonstrate to the Farmstead Museum folk that, yeah, this, this is something which is feasible and we can do that. Um, and then hopefully by the end of the year, actually start to begin on-site installation, which would then go into uh, 2023. And that's all fairly ambitious, I've got to admit, and COVID doesn't help, uh, but hopefully we'll begin to see the end of that. Um, any comments on that, Jim? No, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, um, ambitious, but yeah, that's what we got to be. And next slide. I think. Um, all this does costs. So far, costs have been fairly modest. Uh, but once you start looking at lining materials and concrete and this and that, um, the costs will mount up. Really grateful to the Canal Society of New Jersey for um, uh, a, a really generous contribution. Also, the Liberty Historic Railway. Um, uh, Bill McClevey came through with that, and also Canal Watch uh, too. So we have some funds, we probably will need more, uh, but at least it's given us a very, very good start. And the next slide, I think. And here's some of the team uh, members here. We uh, Amazing what people have in terms of different skills. Um, uh, Eric Schuster there actually makes concrete swimming pools and was able to help us and advise us on the lock construction. Uh, George Pauls was a surveyor, so he gave us help there. So again, um, we've reached out to people and I'm sure we're most willing to have other volunteers um, uh, to help with this project. I think that may be our last slide, Jim. Black screen. It is, yep. So I think any questions or comments which we can address? Uh, looks like there was a comment in the chat. Um, just uh, noting that the major storm, uh, like the one some some of the ones we've been experiencing, could create damage and a surge of runoff and erosion. Uh, any way of controlling that in the future and also best wishes on an innovative project. Oh, great. Yes, it, it was part of our site was underwater at the biggest storm uh, there, but uh, it, it, it wasn't flowing. And so I do think that's one of the good things about the very heavy concrete locks that uh, they're not going to be moved around, I think. So, uh, Given that we're a water feature anyway, a, uh, a flood isn't isn't catastrophic. <laughs> I think the the original canals, uh, Joe could correct us here, had some overflow control capabilities as well, uh, at various points to keep that uh, storm surges like that from yeah. cascading through the entire system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spillways, yeah. So probably two-way traffic. Yes. Uh, 
the Farmstead Museum also kindly has offered us some accommodation for equipment and things when the canal is not being used. So we have some storage on site, which is really helpful. Um, and so, uh, uh, and then as Jim has mentioned, during the winter months, I think we probably drain the canal as well to, uh, uh, so we don't get uh, frost damage. And, re and remove the gates, yeah. Remove the gates. So is there a, a contact for volunteers or donations? Uh, well, actually on the uh, Canal Watch site, uh, that is, uh, there's a site uh, there, I think I'm correct in saying, is Linda on the call? I think, I think I'm right in saying that uh, you can reach us through there. Um, certainly myself uh, would be a contact uh, as well. So you're most welcome to give me a call, or my email. Excellent. Really appreciate the opportunity to share this with you. Thank you so much. It's a uh, project. Thank you for amazing. sharing. Yep. Okay. Are you passing it back to me now, Jeff? Yes, sir. You are now visible. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, folks, for for joining us. Uh, this has been. Um, an interesting evening. Uh, I think I'd like to know how you folks enjoyed um, this approach. Um, this is, uh, I, I guess, in the past we've had you know set pieces and uh, uh, presentations, all very interesting. Uh, but this is this is the kind of thing that goes on all the time. The Canal Society is a statewide organization. We have many projects and many partners, and you've heard from many of them today. So there's all, this is the kind of thing that goes on almost every day. And so uh, if you folks enjoy what we've done tonight, we'll do it again. And we'll try to bring you up to date on the kinds of things uh, that we're doing. And we really, really enjoyed hearing from Rich and from you folks with your DNR uh, project. It sounds really marvelous. And so uh, I brought you up to date with some of the stuff that's going on with the D, uh, the uh, Mars Canal Greenway. And so uh, I hopefully you've enjoyed. Uh, we have a lot of events coming up. Uh, probably too many to mention here, but uh, just for starters, uh, the Canal Society is gonna be participating in uh, Morris County's Pathways of History. That's an event that's been going on for, uh, for years and it gives, um, some of the uh, smaller museums a chance to be open over the course of a weekend uh, to the general public uh, so they can go sort of one from one to the other and visit some places they might not ordinarily have a chance to go. Now, well, we haven't participated in the past because we really don't have a site and our, 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 our site in, at, uh, at Waterloo is not in Morris County. Uh, we were hoping that we would be able to host uh, pathways at uh, the lock site in Wharton, but it's not, it's not going to be ready. But the lock site in Wharton is going to be ready in August at the earliest. Construction projects, they always go over. But we will be partnering with the Booton Historical Society uh, at Booton, and we'll be giving a walking tour, and we'll have a, a, a table and some volunteers there. So uh, you might consider joining us there and seeing some of the other Pathways of History sites. That will be well advertised. There's also going to be a May program meeting. Waterloo Canal Day is scheduled for June the 4th. And Wharton Canal Day is going to be on August the 20th. And so um, just a few of the events coming up. Um, I guess we'll, we, we will soon have a, a full calendar up on the website so that uh, you guys can, can uh, please uh, join us. So. Um, if uh, you'd like to revisit any part of uh, the presentations tonight, the, uh, uh, the recording will be on our YouTube channel. Uh, if um, we know people who weren't able to join us tonight and would like to, um, to join and see the, the, the presentations, uh, please let them know about checking us out online. Um, I guess uh, the May meeting, uh, we're kind of in the throes of wondering, uh, we're all here once again, Zooming together, and uh, people seem to be liking that. Uh, however, we've had a history of meeting in person. We were able to, oh, uh, when COVID subsided a little bit, we had two online in-person slash uh, meetings with some people uh, coming together at the community club and 
um, Brookside, Brookside, and uh, a lot of you joining us also online, and that seemed to work very well. But uh, we'd like to hear from you folks about uh, what you'd like to do now that COVID is allowing us to get together once again. Um, we would like to have uh, uh, some more ambitious uh, in-person meetings at some of our old, uh, old, old and favorite locations with uh, refreshments and conversation and a lot of togetherness. Um, um, we wanna hear from you folks if you'd like to do that again. Uh, we would like to also continue uh, wherever we are or whatever we're doing is also including you folks who join us from a distance um, because now that's possible. So we're gonna try to keep doing that again but I'd like to hear from you folks about how um, you'd like to, uh, if you'd like to start once again, getting together in person. So, okay, thanks for joining us. Um, watch us online and um, enjoy your spring. I look forward to seeing you at meetings and events and um, enjoying the warmer weather. So uh, the meeting is closed and enjoy your weekend. It's been good to be meeting with you all.